were talking about pursuits of ATVs and dirt bikes and things like that. Uh, the commissioner can talk a little bit about kind of how we got to some of the things we've done this year that people um, maybe aren't aware of, uh, but there is a policy that governs pursuit of dirt bikes and ATVs for the division. We started using the uh, all-purpose, multi-purpose vehicles that we have to engage these offenders. Uh, these multi-purpose vehicles uh, are smaller. It's not a 2,000-pound car. The officers are instructed. They know that uh, safety is always first. And the officers are able to follow these people. When they go off the road and they end up on the railroad tracks or in the woods off of West 130th, we're right there behind him. And what he's saying, he has his own dirt bike. <laughs> you guys saw it. Mm -hmm. A street legal. Monsters, it's Rich Weiss reporting for Tree Monster TV. We're here at Visible Voice Books where we are going to be having a press conference on Cleveland police pursuit policies. We have behind us some motorcycle police who are going to share with us some of the new capabilities of some of the police motorcycle equipment. Let's take a look. We're here with Traffic Commissioner Muick, who's going to describe for us a little bit about the new motorcycles and equipment that our Cleveland Police have. We have three BMW all multi-purpose vehicles, and if you'll notice the difference between these vehicles and the Harleys, you have engine protection for going off-road with the vehicles, you have the higher shock area to allow for more uh, bounce when going off-road. You notice that the officers that are assigned here, they have full face helmets as opposed to the half helmets that the other officers have it's for more protection for these officers. We have an inside the helmet speaker system for these vehicles so the guys can make broadcasts from inside the helmet, the protective gear that the guys have. They have chest protectors, elbows, shoulders, and that's all again for going off-road. They're very effective vehicles. It's worked well for us. Uh, when we go out, these are the lead vehicles uh, that will engage the off-road vehicles. The other vehicles are the support vehicles, the motorcycles. And again, uh, we sent our officers, we sent three officers out to Almeda County Sheriff's Department where they trained for two weeks in off-road riding. And uh, they're very skilled. They've come back and they've created a program for us to begin training our officers. So we're gonna train additional officers to do off-road riding. And we also have budgeted for next year an additional three off-road vehicles and an additional sets of uh, the protective gear and the uh, larger helmets. It looks like a pretty huge advance in the motorcycle unit of Cleveland Police Department. It is, it is. And it's, it's responsive to uh, changing trends throughout the country. We've looked at this throughout the country, and uh, we've watched to see how other cities are handling it and tactics that they've used before we came up with this. And uh, we're pretty confident in the plan that we have. We're going to take ourselves upstairs and have a press conference about some pursuit policy from Cleveland Police. As you know, that pursuit can end a disaster for those who are being pursued, for those doing the pursuit, and for those uh, people who get caught up in the pursuit. So a lot of discretion is given to police officers in regards to that with some parameters around that discretion. So we call it an appropriate pursuit policy. There is a no blanket, do not pursue. That's not, that's incorrect. People committed crimes and who are fleeing in a stolen vehicle or a felon or a misdemeanor, in pursuit of a car, pursuit of a truck, pursuit of a motorcycle, each of these have their own nuances to them. 
the mayor is right. The, the division has a 15-plus uh, page policy on pursuits that guides our officers and when they can and cannot pursue a vehicle and what those circumstances are. Uh, basically, we pursue vehicles that are involved in felony crimes, uh, crimes of violence, and we also, of course, pursue vehicles that are involved in um, where we suspect the driver is intoxicated, uh, operating a vehicle while intoxicated. Uh, specifically to the point that we're here for, we also have uh, what we call a, a, a tactical pursuit policy for altering vehicles, uh, especially vehicles, dirt bikes, things like that. Again, uh, our basic pursuit policy covers uh, violent felonies, OVI crimes like that, crimes of violence. Uh, the mayor kind of touched on it a little bit. You know, when you pursue a person uh, for a suspected crime uh, in the streets of any city uh, using vehicles, uh, some vehicles in excess of 2,000 pounds, then there's a certain danger in that. And our job is to lessen that danger as much as possible while still being able to do our jobs. And, you know, for us, it, it's a proposition that we weigh uh, the, the benefit of catching that person, and this is addressed in our policy, versus that danger that it inflicts on our community and having that pursuit. So if that person gets away, are they going to go and commit another violent crime? Or if that person gets away, it's a minor traffic offense, is that going to be a detriment to society? So our officers are guided by those policies in that way. Yes. How familiar are the officers with the 15-page policy? If I asked your average officer uh, to recite the major points of the policy, would they be able to do that? Well, they should be able to do that because they're held accountable for that pursuit policy. Uh, you know, like, just like they're held accountable by all of our general police orders, our rules and regulations. Uh, an officer, any Cleveland officer, should be able to tell you the basics. We're allowed to pursue, pursue vehicles for violent felonies, for OVI, and for anything else that the officer can articulate to a supervisor that warrants a pursuit. Officers should be able to tell you those three things. I have a rumor that I'd like to print the correct answer to. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of bank robberies in Euclid, and the cars head straight to Cleveland because they think they're not going to get chased. Uh -huh. Well, that's I would love to be able to print that they're going to get chased. So. We pursue bank robbers all the time. Okay, and we catch them all the time. That's so great news. It, it's a violent felony crime. Our officers are allowed to pursue for a violent felony crime. If, if, you, if you're a police officer in Euclid, you just robbed a bank, they're not going to stop because they got to the Cleveland border. They're, they're in pursuit. What they will do is they'll ask for assistance. The, the other major thing that you have to understand about pursuit policies and whether or not someone should or should not pursue, uh, there is, uh, if correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, there is um, a requirement that they check in. So it, it gets to the point that you have to notify a supervisor, a supervisor that right. you're in pursuit. And then you, I guess, depend on what's going on in the, in the circumstances of the moment, uh, you update that supervisor periodically. Exactly. And then that supervisor can, maybe you're going uh, 50 miles an hour and you just hit it down, you're in downtown now. You let the supervisor know. The supervisor then will do what? Well, the supervisor has a discretion to, what, to terminate a pursuit or allow it to continue. The officer initiates the pursuit. The supervisor is made aware of the pursuit. The supervisor, as the mayor say, is going to ask questions about the pursuit. What's it for? What direction you're traveling? Uh, what's the traffic conditions? That kind of thing. And determining whether or not that pursuit can continue. Uh, some pursuits, uh, it's, it really is up to that sector supervisor. Uh, because they're ultimately responsible for what their officers do. The officer is responsible, and then the responsibility goes up to that frontline supervisor who monitors that pursuit and takes control of it. So if that frontline supervisor allows the pursuit to continue, that's not within our policy, then they're just as accountable as the officers that initiate the pursuit. So sometimes you will get the supervisor terminate the pursuit. Well, a supervisor probably had good reason to terminate their pursuit. The speed, 
uh, the crime involved itself, uh, whether or not we're in a residential or highly populated area or whether we're on the outskirts of town, all that plays into whether or not that supervisor is going to terminate that pursuit. Are there an unlimited number of cars that can uh, no. be involved in a pursuit? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, initially, it's two cars. Uh, the supervisor can't allow more cars to be involved in that pursuit, again, based on the crime, based on the location, based on a lot of other factors. Uh, the supervisor has that purview to allow additional cars in the pursuit. We've had pursuits where there's only one vehicle involved because it was so far away from the other vehicles, that's the only vehicle that was involved. And we've had pursuits where there were six or seven police cars involved. We have pursuits where there are ten cars, where there are two cars. So it depends on what's going on, it depends on how many cars are actually available in that area to assist, and it depends on what we're chasing that person for, or those suspects for. So there's a lot that goes into determining uh, whether or not to continue a pursuit, uh, first of all, to even allow the pursuit to continue, whether or not to continue it, and then whether it's terminated. Uh, Chief, as, as you're aware, the 100 37 shot atrocity in Cleveland is partly responsible for the change, some changes in policy. So, what changes yes, so. have been made to assure that officers follow the chain of command when in a pursuit, when they're asked to beg off, or uh, follow the rules of pursuit uh, when in a pursuit? Well, again, we have a policy that the officers are responsible for knowing and abiding by that policy, and if they don't, there are consequences. They're held accountable for it, as well as supervisors and anybody else involved in that pursuit. For us, it's, it's uh, the discretion of the officer and the supervisor is the key. That's the key. Uh, because you mentioned uh, uh, the East Cleveland, 137 shots in East Cleveland. You, if you listen to the tapes, you'll find some supervisors actually terminated. They actually said their that officers. They, they terminate their officers and do no more. And those officers who continue beyond that order are, Dis were disciplined for that. You know, the policy is designed to keep people as safe as possible during those situations. You know, we can't, you know, rule out everything that's going to impact an officer or a citizen. Uh, but we try to do our best to make it as safe as possible and then give their officer guidance as to when and when to not pursue. Uh, the gentleman brought up the question about the 137 shots, and the mayor talked about certain supervisors got on the air right then and there and said, you will not pursue. My officers are terminated from this pursuit, while other supervisors didn't, and why other supervisors didn't say anything. Our current policy makes it clear on what the duties and responsibilities are for a supervisor in a pursuit. We don't think it was clear enough before, although I think it was clear, but obviously it wasn't clear enough, so we clarified it. We made it a lot stronger. We made sure that our supervisors understand their responsibility in the pursuit. And, you know, it, as the Chief said, it's, um, particularly if you're in community meetings, you know, I go to community meetings, the councilmen go to community meetings, and, 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 and people, uh, people aren't clear on things. If you take the time to clarify it, uh, most of them will say, oh, I didn't know that. Then some of them will not agree with it. They, a police officer is usually not someone who's going to be in a um, debating mode. They're not usually going to get in a debate, debating mode for right? a community group. They usually won't do that. The new motorcycle helmets have communication devices in them. You're able to actually uh, speak back and forth, and that's it. Seems like uh, like things are going in the direction of improving and strengthening communication during some of those uh, some of those tense moments. Right. That's correct. All right, and, and to, to kind of get to I guess the crux of why we are here in the first place, we're talking about pursuits of ATVs and dirt bikes and things like that. Uh, the commissioner can talk a little bit about kind of how we got to some of the things we've done this year that people um, maybe aren't aware of, uh, but there is a policy that governs pursuit of dirt bikes and ATVs for the division. Um, in the spring, I was tasked by the chief to come up with a uh, policy and procedures to uh, engage these uh, off-road vehicles that were taken over the streets. Uh, we worked diligently on a policy. We looked uh, 
throughout the country at the way other cities were handling it. And uh, we generated a policy that was uh, based first upon safety. And again, as the chief uh, stated earlier, the safety not only of the officers involved in the general community, but also the offender. Uh, this is just a traffic violation in most cases. We implemented an intelligence collection uh, system. Uh, we have an officer designated from each district to collect intelligence regarding the dirt bikes, like if there's a congregation place, if there's an escape route that they use, do they go up these railroad tracks when they see police cars coming, all of those types of different information. Uh, we also work with the Fusion Center and with the uh, Ohio State Highway Patrol regarding the same things. And then we started using the uh, all-purpose, multi-purpose vehicles that we have to engage these offenders. Uh, these multi-purpose vehicles uh, are smaller. It's not a 2,000-pound car. The officers are instructed. They know that uh, safety is always first. And the officers are able to follow these people. When they go off the road and they end up on the railroad tracks or in the woods off of West 130th, we're right there behind them. What he's saying, he has his own dirt bike. <coughs> you guys saw it, so mm -hmm. yeah. street legal. Right. right. When we go out, we use uh, generally, we will, you have to have the dirt bike to engage. And uh, when we go out and uh, we will uh, have three or four additional motor officers there, and then we'll have a supervisor in a car. And the motor officers are there to uh, help limit escape routes or to possibly corral these people. And what's the motor officer? Uh, those are on the Harleys, the other officers. Right, on the Harley Davidsons. The Harley Davidsons. Uh, we've also budgeted for three additional uh, off-road vehicles this year and for the uh, protective gear for the officers that operate them including the helmets with the in the helmet speaker system you'll notice that uh, the officers that were uh, on the all-purpose vehicles their cameras are mounted on the outside so we get pictures of what they look at whatever they look at is what we see um, Again, the intelligence part aspect of it is very important, and the supervision, to touch on what the chief said, the supervisor's responsible. If, uh, if it turns out that this is uh, a time when a school's getting out in the area or something, it's not worth it. We're stopping. So you, you never gave an order for to not pursue dirt bikes? No, they have a general police order, right? Right. No, I think some of what you may be getting, and again, the, the mayor part, uh, I mean, I think you can probably see that for what it is, people just talking. Um, but is, is there a no pursuit policy on dirt bikes? No. Uh, the commissioner and his folks have permission to do that. Uh, do I allow a regular zone car to pursue a dirt bike down a, a city street? No, we don't, because they're never going to catch them. And they're going to put their lives and everybody else's lives in more danger by pursuing that dirt bike. Because our police cars can't go up on the sidewalk and through parks and over curbs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, the mayor just gave us 65 new police cars, and I know he don't want us to wreck them going over curbs chasing dirt bikes. And again, it's almost impossible for a, a four-door police vehicle to catch a dirt bike. It's so that's why we... Is it even for one of these Harleys? Exactly. That's, oh, why, and that's, why, that's why we bought uh, the multi purpose dirt bikes. bikes. Right. Uh, so you have to look at this thing. Like the commissioner says, we've looked at cities all across this country uh, Baltimore, D.C., Philadelphia has a huge issue with this. And they have for probably the last seven or eight years. This isn't something new. It's not unique to Northeast Ohio and Cleveland. It's all over the country. Come next spring, when we get our additional multi-purpose bikes out there and additional officers trained and our intelligence up to where it needs to be, you're going to see fewer and fewer of these people out there riding these dirt bikes because they know the consequences. And, and, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not going away. No, no. It's not going away. It's a very popular uh, urban thing, all over, thing the all over the country, and it, and it's growing. You, I tell you, you watch uh, little kids who have bicycles. What do they do? They emulate, right? 
Yeah. They yeah. emulate yeah. and they ride in packs as if they're dirt bikes. And they do wheelies, they do tricks on these bikes. So, I mean, there is not going away. The, the issue becomes how do we uh, how do we impress upon people uh, uh, what the parameters are, right? right? First of all, is it illegal, right? Is it illegal? But if if uh, so, the between the, the pursuit policy and the, and uh, the tactical things that the commissioner is doing, it, the, the message is getting out. They, Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. If I just wanted to add, when you mentioned that it's nationwide, uh, we did assist Washington, D.C. Right. in identifying riders that were right. from Cleveland. That were going to D.C. Through our intelligence the officer in, uh, in the Bureau right. of Traffic. It was able to identify somebody who went to Washington, D.C. and participate in a road takeover. Right. You know, and I was actually in D.C. Um, early this summer. Uh, my daughter lives in that Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. And right there on TV one night, 6 o'clock news, 50, 60 dirt bikes riding down Pennsylvania Avenue. And, you know, I won't say what their response was, uh, but it wasn't our response. And they rolled down Pennsylvania Avenue in our nation's capital. So that's how big this thing is. So if we want to attack it by trying to allow everybody to chase them all over the place and if you want to get hurt it's not going to work because other cities have done that with no success none whatsoever uh, you can go back and look at youtube videos of philadelphia police department and dirt bike riders there's some legendary what they call legendary dirt bike riders in philly and you can see dozens of police cars all dirt bikes all and nobody being stopped nobody being caught the only way to catch them if they fall off so, you know, you got all that metal flying around a residential area, somebody's bound to get killed. And that's not how we do it here in the city of Cleveland. Chief, can I ask you a question? I'm a yes. former dirt bike rider from okay. the CRA Very good, very good. I was from the CRA, and I rode bikes until uh, I was 40 years old, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, take Monday mornings anymore after I was busted. Uh, I understand. <laughs> I think most of them are stolen, and can't you pull over bikes just to check regis, check to see where well, that bike's again, from? Again, Judge well, we're not going to tell you that uh, some of these bikes out here aren't stolen. Well, like we say, out of the 14 or 15 that we actually confiscated this year, there were three that were stolen. Um, okay. But can I give you a, a, an accurate number on what percentage what that are out say? here? Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't tell you that. Uh, I mean, if it's stolen, they're not going to pull over and let us run the bin. So we're going to have to pursue them. Correct. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, if it's somebody that's riding that doesn't know the law so much and, oh, I didn't know I had to have headlights and turn signals and had to have a, okay, some of those may pull over, but for the most part, they don't. Uh, whether they're legal uh, as far as somebody bought them that dirt bike or not, they're not going to just pull over uh, because for the most part, they know they're engaging in the legal activity can, as far as the traffic. What, what I found was that they barter. Yeah, they do they that. Barter. There's a lot they, of trade. They, they, there's, no, there's no transference of titles. No. They barter. <laughs> you know, you got something, I got this, and they just barter. They give a little money, they trade with this, they trade with that. So they, they do a lot of bartering. Right. And, and it's, it's like, it's, uh, it's just street, they do it street sales. And, and very few will you find have a title, but um, even if it's not titled to that person, it doesn't mean it's stolen. Correct. Because they may barter the thing. Right. That's what I would right. find. And, and we have, um, through social media and through our media, put out, you know, don't trailer out three dirt bikes from somewhere in southern Ohio, meet at a city park, and let the guy test drive the dirt. Because he ain't giving it back. Exactly. So we, uh, we're also in the process of trying to set up some safe exchange locations if people want to do that. Um, but we've kind of tried to get the word out. If a person wants to buy it, you list it on Craigslist or wherever, then you know, meet at a designated place, get that person's ID before you start doing a transaction and let the person test drive your dirt bike. Uh, because you know, a lot it's of times that does out. happen and they do steal them. But we don't have exact percentages on how many we think are stolen or not. Um, I, I wouldn't even want to put a number out there, uh, but people just need to be careful. Uh, you know, I, I saw a thing uh, probably about a month ago, uh, one of the news stations, 
of a, uh, a motorcycle company down uh, somewhere in southern Ohio where the guys smashed through the door and they just came and they were just rolling bikes out and dirt bikes and crotch rockets and you name it. They were just rolling them out of the uh, showroom after a smash and grab and they were putting them on, on these covered trailers and taking them out of there. If a cop on Lorraine is up on 110th and sees a dirt bike riding down the street, is he supposed to just go up there and say, where's your registration and paperwork? I know he's got to be carried. If the person is sitting there, he's probably going to go and confiscate the dirt bike because it's illegal to be on the street. Okay. But if the guy zooms by him at 50 miles an hour, he's not going to go in pursuit of that dirt bike because he's not going to catch him. And in most so, cases, in most cases, they know they're doing something illegal. Right. If the police come, they go. Right. They're not going to stop and wait and say, yeah, I just stole this take it officer or, yeah, it's not registered or I bartered from a friend. You know, they're, they're not going to stand and wait for that. They're going to try to get away, which is kind of what sparked this whole conversation. You know, our frontline officers are not going to pursue in a black and white police car a dirt bike down the street because they're never going to catch them. And like the commissioner says, we have identified folks, and then after the fact, we went to lo location, confiscated the dirt bike, and wrote that person a citation. Or we didn't quite identify the person, but we got a call, hey, there are three dirt bikes in this backyard. We sent officers, knocked on the door, talked to the people, identified who owns them, make sure they're not stolen, and let them know you can't ride these on the streets. If we see you on the streets, if we can catch you, we're going to confiscate them. And what happens if you saw them pull up in that yard and park in the back? Oh, then so we can go get it. We still take it. Yeah. yeah it's a violation. We right, witnessed right. it. We so would you take can it. tow it at right. point. Right. But yes. we can't go on your private property yes. just because you have a dirt bike parked in your backyard and take it. We can't even go on your property, to be honest, unless you give us permission. Mm -hmm. So if we get word from somebody, hey, there are five dirt bikes in this backyard, like the commissioner said, we're going to knock on the door, we got a complaint from the neighborhood that your kids are riding dirt bikes in the area, can we go take a look at them? Oh, they're not riding, we only take them down to you know, Medina on the weekends. Well, let's take a look at them. If they allow us to do that and they come back stolen, then we're going to confiscate them and somebody's going to be charged. So we've been checking in on it frequently, and we know certainly over the past year that the groups have gone from 50 to 60 to like 8, 10, and at I, most, well, at five a, or six. A lot of it is through, uh, again, a lot of it is through this unseen actions that have been taken. But Councilman, you had a Sure, I mean, that's something that, you know, I've been on council for a year and a half since I took over. Um, you know, immediately the issue with Clark Field came to, you know, my attention. And, you know, this is just talking about the collaboration between you know, administration, the police department, the council person, the community, because I worked, you know, immediately with Commander Stocko in the second district, um, federal information to him, neighbors were calling him, uh, and the second district officers did an incredible job mitigating the issue in Clark Field, and it was a problem for a while, um, and we worked directly with the residents right that overlook, you know, they're right next to Clark Field, and, um, you know, the commander worked to set up operations around big events, around intelligence that we provided for him, um, and they were able to really crack down on that activity in the park. Um, so that, I mean, to me, that, that was absolutely an issue, and it kind of showed how everyone working together, we were able to attack that issue. Um, so, I mean, it's gotten much better. And I'm, I'm familiar with that situation because I talked to the sergeant that ran that situation. And they handled it, and they handled it correctly. They didn't do it while the guys were riding. They waited till they parked, and that was it. No danger. Nobody got hurt, and, and they put a big dent in it. Right. And and, and uh, what you would find interesting is there's certain um, certain places become congregation places, uh, in in uh, Carew's yeah, Park, Carew's Park, and then up there Gordon Park. You know, and, and it's like uh, a, a big gathering. Mm -hmm. of, of, it could be hundreds, hundreds of, of bikes. They, they do the same thing with cars. They have, um, uh, I guess, car tricked out type. cars, yeah, and, right. they, and they're, they're car show, I guess. And they just go up there and they just park their cars everywhere. And in parks, and people, and, and they socialize around these items. It could be a dirt bike, it could be a, 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 a cars, it could be whatever. So it's, it's a culture. It's a culture. That's why I say it's not going, it's not going away.
question is how do you how you keep it within parameters and how do you provide alternatives so if you want to do it like 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 you say you you had an alternative when i see these kids riding down the rain on dirt bikes uh i'm That's, saying to myself how do yeah, they yeah. how do they buy well those? you know let, let me let me don't think that everybody who are uh, uh who who's riding in cleveland are necessarily from cleveland okay you know it's it's uh you know there's a so you're saying they're riding in from Lindhurst? Oh, they're, they're riding, riding in, in from, from Richmond from Heights? Ever. I mean, they could be black, yeah. white, Hispanic. Uh, you, matter of fact, um, if they'll go, uh, they'll, they'll groups, like you were saying, in D.C., they'll take trips to other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll, they'll put all their bikes in, in these huge vans, and, and they'll catch a plane. Detroit, they, Detroit comes here all the time. So it's it's not it's not like it's it's just but it's but it's the urban form of dirt bike is urban riding as opposed to dirt riding is pavement riding and and so when you get on the dirt side of it uh, then you could go out in the rural areas and people do what they do but in urban centers you don't have that that kind of openness so they ride they ride on the street but people come from other cities come and I think. Uh, Cleveland riders go to Detroit, Detroit, DC. DC. Yeah. They travel all over the country. It's also impossible to tell you know, someone's income level by looking at them. I mean, you don't That's know. right. That's right. right. Okay. What we attempt to do is to do uh, interdiction, prevention, yeah. interdiction, and choice. Right. You know, we look at this in a holistic way. If legislation has been introduced that strengthens the, uh, the penalties associated with this, even to the point that you can't ride up to a gas station uh, uh, and, and just put gas in an off-road vehicle. It's, you know, we introduce less. Now, if you brought it on a trailer or on a pickup, that's different. So, so we're looking at this in, from different aspects. We do the enforcement in a safe way. In a safe way, we do the enforcement. We, uh, uh, we, we're looking there, we work with, actually talk to the different people who are the leaders in the dirt bike community, urban dirt biking, and so that they can communicate to uh, the people who listen to them about what is improper behavior. We think that has had some effect on it and, and, in terms of the prevention side. And then we want to create uh, an opportunity for them to make a choice to go somewhere else and not have to travel two miles, I mean, uh, 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 two hours or an hour and a half or even an hour because, you know, so you give them an opportunity to pick another way of doing this. So we're looking at this a holistic way and I don't think there's any other city in the country who's no. addressed in, in this holistic way. No. They're, they're all saying the police, the police, police, pursue them, pursue them. Well, that's a great political kind of thing, and it's a great, you know, it sounds good, and it, it, but it simply does not work if you don't do it right. You're not going to catch them. It doesn't work. But this way, we believe we can have impact by doing uh, prevention, uh, talking to the Groups and telling them, look, you need to let you you can't be doing this stuff. You know, interdiction, towing bikes, arresting people, passing legislation, increasing penalties, and then giving them an opportunity. It's it's uh, right. it's not going away. You guys need to talk to uh, Baltimore City Police Department because uh, we've done had a lot of contact with them over the last year and a half. Uh, they have an impound lot that probably has a thousand dirt bikes in it they've confiscated over the years, and they still have hordes of dirt bikes up and down the streets. So and this is a city that's had this problem longer than we have, and they've confiscated over the years over 1,000, 1,500 dirt bikes. And the bikes. thing is, if they don't have title, they can't get the bike right. out. So because so they, they barter, right. they don't have the title, right. they barter. Right. But the point is, they've done just what people are asking us to do. Get out there, chase them down, get them, and however way they've confiscated that many dirt bikes, and they still have the exact same problem. And now they're they're talking about 
some kind of exactly, alternative to, exactly what because we're what they've been doing for the last six years is not working. So we look at all these other places and why should we go down that road and make the same mistakes when they already show us what the result is? I mean, that's kind of, that's crazy. Right. The right. one thing I want to impress on everybody here is please call them in. Exactly. Don't right. think that it's not worth the phone call. 621-1234, call it in. We've worked with the Communication Control Center. They have, uh, they've changed, they have a special classification for them. Every day, my officer, the intelligence officer working on this thing will get all of the calls that involved off-road vehicles from the day before. We're able to pull some intelligence out of their locations, escape routes, whatever. And of course, we pass them on to the districts. If we have a definitive address, we'll ask the district to go out and have a conversation. Commissioner, I think it's such an important point to reemphasize, because um, a lot of times, as a council person, I'll get the first call. <laughs> And my first question is, did you call the police? The answer is no, and I tell them, hang up immediately and call the police. I don't mind being the second call, um, but you know, to remind residents to always call the police. You know. And in a lot of these cases, you know, to be brutally honest with you, nothing may not happen right then and there, but you're giving us the ammunition we need for it's the future. incident reports. Right. right. When you know where there's incidents, then they know where to deploy. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for taking the time and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and addressing the community level. I think uh, this will be a nice experiment in trying to get messaging out to the community at the grassroots level instead of just going for the uh, mainstream media and trying to trickle messaging down. Because your, your, um, your reason for reporting is distinctly different. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Exactly. Right. That's right. And I understand that. Right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you to get the information out. It is. Get the information out. Right. We appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And in a lot of these cases, you know, to be brutally honest with you, nothing may not happen right then and there. But you're giving us the ammunition we need for it's the future. incident reports. Right. right. When you know where there's incidents, then they know where to deploy.